Good morning, everyone. A happy and a blessed Sabbath to all of you. Welcome to church. It's wonderful to be back. This is only my second day back, and it is great. And it is even more wonderful to see the beautiful faces of my church family. I'm getting emotional. It's been too long. <laughs> I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to the folks that have joined us online. It is really wonderful. I'm so grateful that we have the technology available to us that enables us to worship together, um, despite the social distancing this morning, social distancing and physical distancing. <laughs> um, this morning, we are going to continue with our Thrive series, Savoring the Fruits of the Spirit, and focusing in, on to, in today's session on faithfulness. And what a wonderful example of faithfulness we have um, in God our Father who is faithful regardless of whether we are faithful or not, because that is just who he is. 2 Timothy 2 verse 13. This morning, I have some very important persons here with me. We have Ariana, Oscar, Hannah, and Jacob, and they are very eager to share with us why their dads are so awesome as we celebrate our fathers this weekend. My dad is amazing because he supports me in everything I do and loves me no matter what. My dad is amazing because he takes us to cool AFL games and I know he loves me. My dad is amazing because he cares for my needs and teaches me more about God. My dad is amazing because he loves me no matter what I do. <laughs> I mean. Thank you guys. Um, and I would just like to say... Sorry. Gone. My dad is getting two Father's Days this year. He, um, South Africa, Father's Day is in June, and here in Australia, it's here in September. And he's visiting and has, due to the COVID restrictions and the travel, been with me for the last six months. So he gets two Father's Days. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, church. How are we all feeling today? Yeah, good. I just wanted to first off honor all of the men and the fathers in our church. Can we just give them all a round of applause because they do so much for our community. And besides then, I'm going to do a shout out to someone who's actually related to me who is turning 85 today. She's absolutely distraught right now. Uh, Judy, Judy lands down in the back. Let's give her a clap. Happy birthday. <laughs> love you, Auntie Judy. Yeah, I love embarrassing you. Okay, so we're just going to do some awesome worship this morning. So if you all could stand on your feet as we sing our first song for all you've done. Yeah. 
be the same Cause you came near From the everlasting To the world we live The Father's only Son And you lived And you died And you rose again on high And you opened the way For the world to live again celebrate Father's Day, our wonderful Father in Heaven. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son. How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scholars it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? Be seated. Our Father in heaven, how wonderful it is to be back here with our church community. I want to begin by thanking you for all these beautiful young people that give their time faithfully each week to lift our spirits in this trying time as we come together. Our Father, how glad we are that you search us out to make us sons and daughters of your family. You are the perfect Father. Today has been set aside to honour our earthly fathers, and we ask a blessing on them and all the special men in our lives. But above all, we give thanks and praise for you. In the words of that beautiful song we've just sung, thank you, Heavenly Father for the unfathomable love that you have shown us in Jesus and what he did for us. 
Jesus gives us hope and comfort in the face of all that has come with COVID. We ask comfort and courage for families split by border closures and travel restrictions, those struggling financially or experiencing stress, loneliness and isolation, ill health, fear, depression. You know their struggles, Father. Walk with them through the valley. Help us all to keep trusting you as our mighty, wise, loving and faithful Father who sees the end from the beginning. We pray as our pastor Lockie shares about the fruit of faithfulness that you will anoint his words and open our hearts and minds as we worship you today. Show us how to remain faithful, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's offering is for the local church community, local budget, and uh, one of the things that didn't stop during COVID was the cost and expense of maintaining and operating this facility. So we hope you're able to help us out today with the local budget offering. If you're wondering how that you can do that, there's a, a slide up on the screen. You can do it through the church e-giving app, or you can find an envelope in the front of your seat there and put your offerings in that and there's a big box at the back of the auditorium here that you can pop it in on your way out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our church community. We thank you for each other. We thank you that many of us have been able to come back together and it's so good to be able to connect with those tuning in online. And we pray, Lord, that you'll move our hearts to give of our, our income to help, help the local church community. It's so important to us to be able to maintain it and keep it functioning so that we might draw in others who don't know the joy of fellowshipping in this way. And we ask all this with a special blessing on this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.
I was really feeling that song. That was awesome. <laughs> so just really great timing, actually, because today we're talking about faithfulness. And one thing that really, you know, resonates with me is how, just like in the video, we all run away from God. He made tons of rules and we broke nearly every single one of them. Yet when we run away, he still tries to be faithful with us. And that's why we're all human. We can never be who God is. You know, it's physically impossible. And so in this next song, I really hope that you just take this time to really worship freely. If you want to sit, if you want to stand, do whatever you want to make you feel free with God this morning. Where your 
Eden to eternity, a design for humanity to abide in divinity. Created with the intention of growth, from the size of a mustard seed, planted in us the name of Jesus, a seed watered by the love of the Father and germinated by the Spirit when we first believed. While fragile at the outset, our roots grow deep in his word and by his power we are made new. Brought from death to life, from suffering into salvation, from aimless wandering to a purposeful life, his living water sustaining us every day. We sprout forth as we share, all the while remaining attached to the one who is our life, Jesus. Now, in the open air, we are invited to soar. We see others and grow together. Yet, with others comes competition, and with competition, comparison, and with comparison, discontentment. We fall into survival mode, feeling alone, broken, hurting, abandoned. We were made for more than this. We were made to thrive. Hello. Welcome. Great to see everyone today. Who has had a good week? Can you give me a thumbs up? Those on the live stream as well, give me a thumbs up as well. I'll check them later, so I'll see if you've had a good week. If I haven't met you before, my name's Lockie. I'm one of the pastors here at Gold Coast Central. I'm so excited that you've decided to join us today. As you've hopefully seen by the bumper that was just played, we're in the midst of a series that we're calling Thrive. Thrive, right? And it's it's centered around this idea that God is interested in more than just us surviving. And I don't know about you, but particularly through COVID-19 over the last six months or so, I feel like I've been doing a lot of just surviving. That it seems to be a lot of just trying to scrape through, just, just trying to get through the day, trying to get to the end of the week, trying to get to the end of the month even. And it can be really difficult in times like that and in those trialing seasons of life to actually thrive. But God has given us directions and instructions in His Word. And what we're doing throughout this series is Mike and I have been unpacking some of these things that God wants to do in our lives. So that no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, we'll be able to feel like we're actually thriving in this life, not just surviving. So if you're a visitor, you've picked a great day to join us, and I want to extend a special welcome to you. Can we just give a round of applause to all our visitors? There are a few that I've seen around today, so thank you for joining us. It's so awesome, and I couldn't start today without actually acknowledging all the, the men and the fathers as well. And um, my, my dad, as some of you know, he lives in the UK at the moment with mum. They've had a really interesting year. Um, but yeah, dad, wherever you are, if you're watching, I'm going to look at this camera. So good to see you, thinking of you. I love you, and I hope to see you soon. Um, I was actually going to be visiting them in a few weeks, but obviously because of COVID, that isn't happening. So um, yeah, it's been a really, really challenging year for a lot of people um, in a lot of different ways. But just know that as we come together today, as we dive into the Word of God, um, that we're going we're gonna to see a, a beautiful picture of who He is. And um, that's what faithfulness is all about. Have you ever done something crazy for, in the name of love? Have you ever done something that you probably wouldn't do but you've done it for the sake of love. When I hear that question, I think of a story I read a few years back. And it was of this man, he was from China, and he loved his girlfriend, right? And he got to the point where he was like, okay, I want to propose to this girl. And so to demonstrate his love, he thought that he would make a purchase that would uh, explain the magnitude of how much he loved his, his girlfriend. And what he did is he went out and he purchased 99 iPhones. So that's about $100,000 worth of Apple products. And he bought 99 iPhones, he laid them out in a heart to to express the magnitude of of his love for his girlfriend. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of full on. Like, that's pretty crazy. Like, I thought rings themselves are expensive, but like... (laughs) Spending $100,000 on like a prop, that's full on, right? And the reason I share this story is because what Jesus has done and is doing for you and for me, many would consider pretty full on. They'd consider it, you know, incredible and, 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 and insane even. 
the sort of way that God acts out his love for us. But that is what faithfulness is all about, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to be looking at today at this fruit of faithfulness that God wants to bring out of us. But before I jump in, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you we can come together, we can dive into it today. I ask you to open our hearts to the word that you have for us. Rid me of myself and speak through me, I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. So what, what are the kind of words or ideas that come to mind when you hear the word faithfulness? What are the things that come to mind? Speak to me. What, what comes to mind? What words? Faithfulness, what, what are you thinking? Trust, yep. Yeah. Courage. 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 Oh, marriage, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. what else? Loyalty. Loyalty. What's the one over here? Love. Consistency. Consistency. Yeah, good words, really good words. Another word that comes to mind for a lot of people is the word um, of, of obedience, or it's like a very practical thing. In the context of faith, faithfulness often conjures up ideas of obedience, of, of doing for God the things that he asks us to do. And it's a very practical word. And to start out today, we need to acknowledge this idea of how obedience is tied in with faithfulness, because they are definitely connected. And as we go through today's message, you're going to see that. But often what our minds do is we kind of go straight from faithfulness to obedience, but we skip a key step. And when we skip that step, what it does is it suggests that faithfulness and obedience are dependent on us. That what we do for God is dependent on what we bring to Him. And while there's definitely some kind of personal responsibility associated with being faithful, if you go straight from faithfulness to obedience and think that's the whole equation, then you're actually missing a key part of what faithfulness is all about. Because faithfulness doesn't start with us. Faithfulness, obedience, doing for God what He asks us to do doesn't start with you and me. So as we open the Word now, I invite you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to go to chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. It's going to be on the Sky Bible or it's going to be on screen for those that are online. But here in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, it says this. And this is kind of God speaking through Moses to His people. It says this, Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. Right? God is God. Seems a bit kind of talking in circles there, but I think what he's trying to say, God is God, you're not God. Just remember that to start this out. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. So we see the idea of obedience coming up there, right? But what came before that obedience? We see his unfailing love. We see, his faith. We see God's faithfulness. If you want to know what the benchmark of perfect faithfulness is, you need look no further than the character of God. Because faithfulness, it starts with how God has been faithful to His people. If you're familiar at all with the story of Scripture, then you'll be aware that this idea of faithfulness is kind of woven throughout the entire story. And there's a particular symbol that we see in the Bible in which this idea of faithfulness is often presented. And the symbol that is used throughout the entire story of Scripture from start to end is the symbol of marriage. It's the symbol of marriage. And we're going to kind of trace this symbol a little bit through the story of the Bible and see what we can learn about faithfulness. So we'll start in the book of Isaiah, chapter 54. In the book of Isaiah 54, verse 5, we see, again, God speaking through a prophet to his people. He says, for your creator will be your husband." The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. He is your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of all the earth. And so here, God is identifying himself as a husband to humanity. God is saying, I am a husband. And that, that kind of by default makes the people of God the bride. Can, can you see the connection that God is saying, hey, I'm, I'm your husband. And that means that you, my people, are going to be my bride. As we continue, we, we see this cycle, and it kind of builds in momentum as you go through the story of, of Scripture, but you see God's faithfulness in contrast with the unfaithfulness of His people. And, and it comes to a point where they, they have gone so far that God decides to use one of His faithful people to give His life as an example of what this relationship has come to. It's gone from a place of what should have been like a secure, safe marriage relationship 
It's one where he gets to the point and he asks a man called Hosea, he says, I want you to go and marry a promiscuous woman, someone who is not going to be faithful to you in marriage. But I want you to go marry her. I want you to love her. I want you to journey with her, to be in relationship with her, because that's what my relationship feels like with Israel. I am being faithful to them. I am loving them. I am trying to help them. I'm trying to give them instructions that can lead them to a thriving life in the world. But they're just consistently being unfaithful to me. And so it comes to a point where the, the case of Israel just seems completely hopeless. I don't know if you've read the book of First or Second Kings, but I've been reading that the last few weeks. And it's just like a new person's introduced, and then they fail. Then a few verses later, a new person's introduced, and then they fail. And every now and then, you kind of have one that does well, and you get a little glimmer of hope. Then the next one fails even worse than ever before. And it just seems to be this continuous, hopeless cycle that humanity can't seem to remain faithful to God. And yet, in spite of all that, God is still being faithful to his people. But we come to a a beautiful promise in the book of Jeremiah. And this promise is one that points towards a future hope in spite of Israel's unfaithfulness. It says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new commitment, a new promise with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife. Again, we see that image of marriage coming up, right, to, to, to talk about God's faithfulness. But this new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions in their hearts. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So we have a promise here in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet because the whole book is him weeping over the hopelessness of Israel. But in the midst of that hopelessness, there is a promise of a future restoration. And I think that's a powerful message for you and me today because whatever situation or circumstances you find yourself in, Maybe you feel a bit hopeless at the moment. Maybe you're feeling a bit down. Maybe you've got family like me who live in Victoria, and you're like, I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to comfort them or help them. In the midst of hopelessness, God speaks hope. He speaks life. And Israel are given a promise of future hope. And so as we fast forward to the end of the narrative of Scripture, in Revelation 19, we see a picture of worship in heaven. And we get to look over the shoulder of John, who's the author of this book. And he sees, again, this idea of of marriage relating to God and his people here. In Revelation 19, verses 6 to 8, it says this. John is writing, he says, Then I heard what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd, or the roar of a mighty ocean waves, or the crash of a loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the for the wedding, for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. She's given this cloak of good deeds. But again, it's the idea of marriage is talked about in relationship to God and his people. So, so what, can we, what can we gather from, from all these texts, all these verses? What's the, what's, the, what's the substance behind it for you and me? The, the reason God speaks in that kind of language of marriage is because he is committed to humanity. God sees himself as one who is responsible for caring for, for looking out for, for saving, for providing for his people. God is a faithful God. You know what that means? It means when he asks us to do stuff in his word, we can trust he has his best interests at heart because the starting point of that is love. God actually loves you and he loves me. And when he asks us to do things, when he gives us his commandments or his instructions, they come from a place of love. But being in relationship, it's always a two-way street, right? So, So we're left with I guess, an obligation, you might say, to respond to some way in, in, in to that love. Because we're in relationship with God. And this whole symbol of marriage, it comes to a head in the person of Jesus, right? 
when Jesus is on earth and he's walking with his disciples, he actually shares a conversation with them. And this conversation takes place just before one that we've been really unpacking throughout this whole series. That, that, that passage in John 15 is talking about a vine and how in order to journey with Jesus, we need to remain connected with him, to walk with him. And that as we do that, it is him that is going to bring out of us those good things that we want in our lives, of love, of joy, of peace. We could go on, right? It's Galatians 5 where we get that verse from. But just before that, Jesus is talking with his followers. And they've come out of a really discouraging conversation where he's basically said to one of his most um, committed followers, he says, you're going to deny me, actually. And he also says he's going to be leaving soon. And we come to John 14, which is halfway through this conversation. And Jesus starts sharing about what's going to happen next. But before we read it, we just got a bit of context we've got to unpack. And that's the context of what marriage meant during the time of Jesus. So it's, it's slightly different to today, because during Jesus' time, marriage had two steps. Okay, the first step was betrothal. At this point, a groom would, would commit to his bride. They would agree on, on a gift price or a bride price that the groom would give to the bride's family in exchange for her hand in marriage. When that agreement was made, the groom would then leave and return to his family's home. There, the groom would prepare a place for him and his bride to come back to and live in. And during that time, the bride would be preparing for the groom to return as well. So that's betrothal. The second phase is the marriage itself. In this phase, the price for the bride is paid to her family. Right? The price is paid, and then the bride is taken and accompanied by a huge procession to join with the groom, and they're taken back to the new home on the family's property. You might be thinking, okay, what on earth does that have to do with, with Jesus and with my relationship with Jesus? Well, keep that in the back of your mind as we're reading these next verses, because you're going to see how this idea of marriage is woven into the fabric of, of faithfulness and of what Jesus is doing right now. So in John chapter 14, again, in the midst of this really unsettling and probably um, troubling conversation, Jesus says to his followers, and by extension to you and me, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I don't know who that's for today, but that's a word for someone. Don't let your heart be troubled. You're facing a, a massive battle or a really trialing situation at the moment. But Jesus offers hope and he says, don't let your heart be troubled. He says, trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so... Would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything's ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. And so in Jesus, this theme of marriage comes to a climax. It comes to a high point. Jesus' promise to return is made something that they can have confidence in because he's used this theme of marriage. It was unheard of for a groom to leave and not come back. That just wouldn't happen. Jesus is promising that he's going to return. He's again reminding us of the profound love that God has for us, the love that God has for you and for me. That, that it's a love that is so intense that he is committed to it. And as we look at the story of Jesus... And we see that, that, that pattern, those, those two steps to marriage. There was actually a price that had to be paid for you and for me, right? In the book of Romans 6.23, Paul says, for the wages of sin is death, right? That's the price. The wages of sin is death. Because of your sin, because of my sin, sin being those things that are adverse to love, that are contrary to love, that separate us from God. For the wages of sin is death. So there's a price to be paid for our lives. But that's not the end of the verse because it says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And if you haven't accepted that free gift, I invite you to accept it today. That there is life, there is love, there is joy in believing in Jesus, in walking with Jesus. So there was a price to be paid. And Jesus takes responsibility for that price. And he's actually paid the price for your sin and for my sin. So he's made a commitment to his people. He's paid the price and all we're waiting for now is him to return. 
There's only one step to go. Jesus is coming soon. That is what our church is all about. We're all about sharing the message. Hey, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus loves you and he wants a relationship with you. And then we come to this idea of faithfulness. What are we to do with this this, this thing about faithfulness? What is my obligation to what Jesus has done for me? Surely the gift can't be unconditional. Surely there's some agenda. Surely there's something I have to do to earn that love or to respond to that love. That's the kind of world we live in, right? It's like nothing is ever truly free. Nothing is ever that good. But I can tell you with confidence today that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, and it is just that good. That God has provided a way for you to be saved, a way for you to experience a deeper sense of joy, of peace, of wholeness, of abundance in your life today. And he's given us instructions in his word about how we can best function in the world around us. But when we think of faithfulness, if we go straight to obedience, we miss the point. Because when you take faithfulness out of the context of relationship, right? when you remove this idea of doing for God away from loving God, that is when faithfulness becomes legalism or, or, or pointless obedience. This obedience that kind of makes me feel like I have to do things for God to continue to receive His love, to continue to, to earn what He's already promised me. When we remove relationship from the idea of faithfulness, we get legalism. And I don't know about you, but there have definitely been points in my journey when I found myself being very legalistic, when I've been trying to earn God's favor, when I've been trying to like, feel good even about myself and how I'm going as a Christian by doing the right things. But when we look at this idea of faithfulness and how it is a fruit of the Spirit, just like everything else we've talked about this series, what it becomes it is something that God wants to bring out of us, right? Faithfulness is something that God wants to, to bring out of us as, he, as, we, as, we, as our hearts are melted by his love. Remember that first verse we looked at where it, it talked about, oh, no, it wasn't the first verse, it was in Jeremiah. It talked about how God wants to write that law on our hearts. He wants to do an inner transformation, an inner work. God isn't interested in just a surface level experience. God wants to come into your heart. He wants you to realize your value, your worth, how much you love him. And that when you realize that, it'll start to flow out of you in the way that you interact with other people, the way that you relate to him. Faithfulness is something God wants to bring out of you. It's not about what you bring to God. And so that brings me to my big idea for today, which is that when we remain in Christ, that's the language we've been using throughout this series about remaining in the vine when we remain in Christ, when we walk with Jesus, when we journey with Jesus, He brings the fruit of faithfulness out of us. Right? When, when you're walking with Jesus, when you're spending time with Him, you'll probably notice that over time, the way you relate to other people starts to change. That maybe you're, you have more love for people. Maybe you have a bit more patience. Maybe you're, you're finding yourself being more gentle with people. Maybe you're finding yourselves wanting to do more for God wanting to spend more time with him. But faithfulness is about remaining with Jesus because it's him that will bring those good things out of you. And so my challenge for you today is very simple. It is to make a commitment this week to spending more time with Jesus. Well, how do you spend time with Jesus, you might ask. I'm glad you asked. You can spend time with Jesus by, by reading his word, the Bible. You can spend time with Jesus through prayer, through communicating with him, through, through asking for, for his help in areas, for, for thanking him for what he's done. You can spend time with Jesus through music. Maybe you just enjoy listening to the words of people that have crafted beautiful melodies in praise of God. You can connect with Jesus by spending time with his people. But by, by attending a life group, by getting involved in the church community, you can be with Jesus by serving others. You can, you can spend time with Jesus in so many different ways, but I challenge you this week to spend more time with Jesus. So, so maybe this past week you really haven't spent a lot of time with Jesus. 
And so if, if you find yourself in that boat, then I challenge you, try and spend five minutes a day with Jesus. Five minutes a day. Find what that looks like for you and commit to spending five minutes a day with Jesus and see if that changes anything in your life this week. Maybe you, you enjoy prayer or you enjoy Bible study and you spend you know, half an hour a day with Jesus. If you find yourself in that boat, then I challenge you in the week ahead to spend an hour a day with Jesus. And that might mean you're getting up half an hour earlier. But see if spending more time with Jesus changes you. Maybe you're a way better Christian than myself and you're already spending like an hour a day with Jesus, right? Then I challenge you, spend an hour and a half with Jesus each day this week. Spend more time with Jesus. There's a quote from a man named Martin Luther who was one of the guys that started the Protestant Reformation. And this isn't a direct quote, this is my version of the quote. But he basically said, if I have a busier day, I don't spend less time with Jesus, now, I spend more time with Jesus because he recognized that when you spend time with Jesus, when you walk with him, when you remain in him, that is, one, that is what is going to set you up to thrive that day, which is what this series is all about. When, when you spend more time with Jesus, that is what is going to bring transformation and healing and wholeness. That is, when it, that is what's going to bring faithfulness out of you. So my challenge for everybody here is to spend more time with Jesus this week. If you want to claim that challenge, like me, I'm going to commit to it as well, then I invite you to pray this prayer after me now. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. I want to spend more time with you this week. I look forward to what you're going to do. as you change me to be more like you. I love you. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pastor Lockie. Let's give him a round of applause for that, because I really took a lot out of that, for sure. I hope you all did as well. So just to finish up the service, I just wanted to thank you all again for joining us in person, and thank you for everyone who's watching online. And for the last song, we're going to sing, Who You Say I Am. So remember, this is the Sabbath. Leave the past week at the door. Let this be your final chance to just let loose and really enjoy worshiping God today. Who am I that the highest king would wear? lost but he brought me in all his love for me all his love for me whom the sun sets free all is free indeed I'm a child Church. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. 
Once again, thank you this morning for joining us. Um, for those that are at church and for those of you that joined us online, it was really wonderful having everybody here and learning about God's faithfulness. If there's anybody that needs special prayer, please come forward to our prayer corner where there will be somebody there who would love to pray with you. And I'd like to pray that you all have a very restful Sabbath and a good week and be confident in God's faithfulness. <laughs>